Um, our speaker today is Dr. Anita Hauck. She is chair and associate professor uh, in the Department of Religious Studies at St. Mary's College in Notre Dame, Indiana. She received her PhD from the University of Chicago. Uh, Dr. Hauck specializes in theological and literary approaches to humor and laughter, uh, a theology of the single life, and the relationship and difference between spirituality and religion. Uh, she's published essays in a number of well-respected venues, including uh, journals like Spiritus, uh, Human Development, the Journal of Religion, and so on. And she's um, currently revising a book manuscript called uh, well, God, God is Not Mocked, right? Laughter yeah, and religious Yeah, I don't know. That's kind of the, maybe y'all can help me come up with a better title by the end of the day. <laughs> I just you. have, do you like it? I do All right, like so it. We'll go with that then. That's great. <laughs> she's an active member of the field. She's vice president, right, right. currently of the College Theology Society. Uh, and her research uh, has been supported by institutions like the Louisville Institute, the Wabash Center for Teaching and Learning in Theology and Religion, and the Lilly uh, Foundation. Uh, Dr. Hack's talk is entitled, Truth in Jest, The Place of Laughter in Spirituality. So please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Weaver. Now, as you might have guessed from that introduction, I have way more to say than you want to hear. <laughs> So just do this at some point if you need to. Um, and it's also obvious I shouldn't even be giving this talk. I mean, any time that you talk about mystery, obviously the first thing, at least that comes into my mind, is fools rush in where angels fear to tread. And then you add the hubris of talking about laughter, which Cicero, although I guess in a humorous talk, we should just call him Cicero, mm -hmm. as many Latinists prefer, uh, complained that all whoever who tried to teach anything, like a theory or art of laughter, proved themselves so conspicuously silly that their very silliness is the only laughable thing about them. A century later, Quintilian, who may well have contributed more than anyone else to Renaissance thinking on laughter, confessed that no one had yet done justice to the topic and that he, being a smart guy, still expected to fare no better himself. If that's not enough, in a cartoon captioned Analyzing Humor, Gary Larson's solemn professor lectures to a room full of dutiful note takers, pointer aimed at a picture of the clown, unaware of the kick me sign on his back. <laughs> So between talking about mystery and talking about laughter, I think it will be amazing if we survive this hour intact. <laughs> well, why risk it? Why care about laughter in the context of Christian mystery and as an aspect of Christian spirituality? Well, as a fan of science, I'm aware of a recent study that showed that people enjoy stories more when they already know the ending. Did anybody see this one? Spoilers are actually good. You will like an Agatha Christie better if you know who killed the person right from the very start. So I'll tell you what I'm going to say today, which is basically that first, laughter is inherently ambiguous and ethical, in particular, relational. Because of this ambiguous relational nature, laughter can rush in where angels do, in fact, tread, namely in the realms of religion. In particular, laughter responds to questions that aren't readily susceptible to answers. We might say, in other words, that it gives us ways to respond to mysteries. To get to this ending, I plan to take Cicero and Quintilian and company on and give you a long, boring disquisition on the nature of laughter. But after that, if you survive, I'll turn to two mysteries of Christian spirituality that laughter has been used to address, Christology and theodicy, the problem of evil in light of the goodness and power of God. And then if there's more time, I'll say a little bit about two growing edges of Christian spirituality in which I think laughter plays a part, namely science and interreligious engagement. Along the way, lest you be tempted to despair by all the Cicero-defying theorizing, I promise to heed the advice of a speaker about whom I heard some years ago. He was at a medical conference and he started out by saying he thought it important that every lecture give people something practical to take away. And he proceeded to show what I can vouch for as a very effective method of tying your shoes. <laughs> so I hope that, I'm not gonna do that today, I'm wearing pumps, but I hope that you will at least come away with one or two good jokes. So, boring disquisition. Why consider laughter in the context of religious mystery? 
Two reasons. First, laughter has an impressive religious pedigree, impressive enough to suggest that we ignore it at our spiritual peril. It shows up in ancient cosmogonies and trickster stories. Homer, Aristophanes, Euripides, and the author of the Homeric hymns seem to have had no compunctions about depicting the gods as laughing or laughable. There's a good deal of laughter in the Hebrew scriptures, the joyous, joyous laughter of exiles returning home, the perhaps incredulous laughter of Abraham and embarrassed laughter of Sarah, Elijah taunting Baal and his prophets, Elisha calling mauling bears on the children who mocked his baldness. That's one of my favorites. <laughs> the laughter of the nations against God and God's prophets, and the quite nasty sounding laughter of God against recalcitrant mortals. There's much less laughter in the New Testament, though Luke's Beatitudes do promise eschatological laughter to those who mourn on earth. Meanwhile, in Gospels that did not make the canonical cut, the child Jesus laughs at his enemies, and a docetic Christ laughs while an image of Christ is crucified in his stead, or in a more disturbing version, while Simon of Cyrene is crucified in his stead. And of course, there's Tertullian, as he eagerly anticipates my laughter, my joy, and my exultation in seeing the magistrates who persecuted the name of Jesus liquefying in fiercer flames than they kindled in their rage against the Christians. <laughs> That's a happy image. Medieval Christianity uses laughter to engage religion in the mystery plays, Chaucer and the Feast of Fools, in parodic prayers that address God with a knowing laugh, and in various works that advocate laughter at the devil and the pagan gods interned with him. And some of these works even suggest that laughing at the damned is one of the pleasures of the blessed and of God, God's self. Milton shows the father and son in a conversation that echoes the heavenly derision of the Psalms. And in the past two centuries, starting with Mark Twain and continuing with Anne Sexton, Charles Peggy, G.K. Chesterton, Isaac Dennison, Stanley Elkin, George Bernard Shaw, and others, Laughter appears not just in satires of religious people, but actually in stories about God. So, it seems to me that laughter's CV commands respect. A second reason to attend to laughter is that it's been so controversial and maligned over the years that you just suspect something important is going on. People just seem to be protesting a little too much. In the Dhammapada, the Buddha asks, how can anyone laugh who knows of old age, disease, and death? The Jesuit theologian Hugo Rahner explains this view as present in Christianity as well. May a Christian go on merrily playing when a stern and strict choice has to be made for eternity. Is it right for him to relax, to ease the senses, when experience constantly reminds him how these same senses draw him down? The letter of James condemns laughter, and the same Luke and Beatitudes that promise laughter to the morning also promise tears to those who laugh. A long tradition has it that Jesus, as befits the loftiness of his origins and the gravity of his mission, never laughed. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Ambrose and Aquinas granted laughter a place in the good human life, but made an exception when it comes to dealing with the sacred. The Muslim tradition, which reveres Jesus as a great prophet, includes a story in which Jesus came upon his disciples and found them laughing. He said, the one who fears God does not laugh. They said, spirit of God, we were only jesting. Jesus replied, a person of sound mind does not jest. Reinhold Niebuhr took a similar stance in a metaphor in which laughter is admitted into the courts of the temple, our everyday lives, but not even its echo can enter the holy of holies where we consider the divine. Now, there have been many attempts to take the mystery out of laughter by putting forth a unified theory to explain it. These theories fall in three major categories. The first, espoused in somewhat different forms by Plato, Aristotle, and Thomas Hobbes, whom one of my professors said had the longevity reserved to the truly obnoxious, claims that laughter arises from a feeling of superiority in the laughter. <clears throat> the second theory, propounded by such figures as Kant, Bergson, and Jean Morial, says that laughter responds to a perception of incongruity in the object. 
The third, advocated most famously by Herbert Spencer and Sigmund Freud, explains laughter as a means of releasing inhibited psychic energies. Now, I don't think such a comprehensive theory of laughter is, in fact, possible, not only because of the present limits of our science, but because of the polyvalence of laughter itself. Not only are there many kinds and causes of laughter, but most instances of laughter are themselves the expression of multiple motives and ambivalent feelings, as Plato's Philebus recognized. So while questions of motivation are surely worth asking, the search for a unified field theory of laughter is probably misguided. Better to heed the cautions of commentators like Eliot Oring, who warns us that humor is crafted ambiguity, and ambiguities do not easily yield certainties. And William Lynch, for whom the comic stands as the great enemy of the univocal mind. Besides being too ambitious and seeking a unified field theory, the second difficulty with most theories is that they tend to try to locate laughter's source in an object, either a target of laughter, for instance, something is funny because it's incongruous, or in the laugher, him or herself. But I think if you just ponder your own experience, you will agree that the same object can seem laughable in one context and not in another. As Mel Brooks's famous dictum has it, tragedy is me cutting my finger, comedy is you falling down a manhole and dying. <laughs> so nothing is laughable in itself. An object seems funny only when it is perceived as such in a social situation in which laughter is possible. Henri Bergson's highly influential theory of laughter notes Napoleon's observation that the transition from tragedy to comedy is affected simply by sitting down. He offers his own illustration of the shift. Try for a moment to become interested in everything that is being said and done. Act in imagination with those who act and feel with those who feel. In a word, give your sympathy its widest expansion. As though at the touch of a fairy wand, you will see the flimsiest of objects assume importance and a gloomy hue spread over everything. Now, step aside. Look upon life as a disinterested spectator, many a drama will turn into a comedy. Now, I think Bergson is quite right in noting the fluidity of laughter. But I think laughter is even more agile and subtle than Bergson admits. When Bergson contends that sympathy precludes laughter, well, I'd say that, in fact, sympathy can simply change the tenor of laughter, making it affectionate rather than derisive, moving us to laugh with rather than to laugh at. Similarly, laughter can be inhibited or changed by social situation. Somber settings may stifle or, embarrassingly, encourage laughter. In some contexts, laughter can be as contagious as yawning. We might laugh also just because our companions do. Even taking a derisive attitude towards an otherwise sympathetic object just to fit in. So the first step in constructing a more viable approach to laughter, I think, is to admit our limits. In particular, to admit that we cannot find any one formula that explains why laughter happens or what laughter means. Laughter is inherently ambiguous, capable of expressing innumerable attitudes and suggesting any number of relationships. In this inherent polyvalence, it has much in common with everything we encompass in the term mystery. So let me make three suggestions of ways I think we can try to understand laughter without pinning it down too much. First, laughter is not limited to one physiological response, but can include a range of reactions. A Buddhist tradition defines six stages of laughter, from a gentle smile to an out-and-out -out guffaw, and contends that the Buddha never indulged in anything beyond number two. So when I use the term laughter, I'd invite you to see a continuum, really, from a simple smile to a chuckle to a chortle to a laughing fit worthy of being slain in the spirit. Second, laughter is necessarily ambiguous and polyvalent. It can express many meanings, humor, joy, embarrassment, cruelty. It is therefore difficult to read, and it is notoriously unstable. Quintilian warned that mirth is never very far removed from derision, and John Calvin 
that it is exceedingly difficult to be witty without becoming biting. Finally, laughter is inherently ethical. It expresses, even enforces, moral values. Many of our jokes are based in mocking those who violate social norms. OK, so here's your first takeaway. So this joke I've heard told about many different groups, but I most recently heard it told, I hope this is OK, since we're talking about religion, I'll use this version, about an Orthodox rabbi, conservative rabbi, and a reform rabbi. So the three of them are out golfing, and they notice that there's a foursome ahead of them that's very, very slow. So finally, they go up to one of the groundskeepers. Say, Do you know anything about these people? Can we play through what's going on? The groundskeeper says, oh, that's actually a group of firemen. They were blinded in a horrible fire some years ago. So you know the management just allows them to come and play whenever they want to. And the Orthodox Rebbe says, oh, that's just horrible. I can't believe we said anything against them. We should be sure and be praying for them right away. And the conservative rabbi says, you know, I have a very talented ophthalmologist in my congregation. I'm going to see if she can do anything for this man. And the reform rabbi says, what the heck? Why don't they just play at night? <laughs> I've also heard that with engineers as the butt, if you prefer. <laughs> Now this raises another aspect of laughter that gets scant attention in most theories of laughter. Most theories focus so much on what makes people laugh that they neglect to ask what laughter does to people. Yet relationship not only permits, inhibits, or alters laughter, it also benefits or suffers from laughter. Sharing a joke with someone can confirm an established friendship or initiate a new one. Ted Cohen, in a brilliant little book called Jokes, from which I got that version of the golfer joke, argues convincingly that shared laughter constitutes a powerful social interchange between teller and hearers. Now you can reflect back on the joke I just told and see if you agree. When you offer your joke, you solicit their knowledge. You elicit it, in fact, virtually against their will. And they find themselves contributing the background that will make the joke work. Thus, they join you. And then they join you again, if the joke works, in their response. And the two of you find yourselves a community, a community of amusement. This is what I call the intimacy of joking. So in this sense, even jokes that have no target or particular moral lesson are ethical, because they define in-groups and out-groups. So this can happen even when there's no target at all. So how many surrealists does it take to screw in a light bulb? Someone knows. Fish. <laughs> All right, now if you don't know anything about surrealists, now you may not like the joke anyway, but if you don't know anything about surrealists, you're definitely not going to like the joke. So by telling it, I have in fact excluded a number of you, and I apologize for that. I, I won't bother explaining it, but we'll get to, there'll be others that you'll get. Um, I tell my students that you don't go to college to get a better job. No one can promise you a better job. You go to college and learn things so that you'll get more jokes. And I think they have found that the assessment on that has been really very impressive. But Cohen's process of knowledge solicitation is even more interesting when the joke does have a target. And you have to decide whether to join me in laughter or not. I was at a conference on laughter a couple years ago, and a male speaker talked about jokes he thought targeted groups that shouldn't be targeted. He told some jokes and invited the audience, as I just did, to contribute the punchlines. So when he asked, how many feminists does it take to screw in a light bulb, I shouted from the back, that's not funny. That's the punchline. <laughs> At the end of the presentation, someone, perhaps like some of you, raised their hand and said, what was the punchline to the joke about the feminists? And the lecturer said something like, wow, some people just don't get it. But that is, in fact, how it works. How many feminists does it take to screw in a light bulb? That's not funny. OK, it's not working. OK, <laughs> so but <laughs> well, now, the knowledge base that this calls forth is what? What do you need to know is a stereotype of feminists in order to get that joke? That feminists can take themselves too seriously. In the work for justice, any worker for justice can get a little bit too serious. So that's the basis. Now, the joke in Cohen's term has solicited the knowledge of the stereotype of feminists as rather humorless. Now, by laughing, you didn't say that you agreed with the stereotype necessarily. Laughter's ambiguous. I don't know why you laughed, those one or two of you who did. <laughs> um, 
But it does say that you join the teller in recognizing that the stereotype exists. Now, it could mean you feel quite vicious about humorless feminists. It could mean that you thought my effort at joke telling was pleasant and enjoyable and you wanted to join me in laughter. Or you could see me dying up here and you were going to do some pity laughing. Apparently, this is a tough crowd and that's not going to happen. So because your laughter is ambiguous, it could mean any of these things or others. Similarly, not laughing could mean you didn't like the joke aesthetically, or you didn't think it was true, or you didn't think it's good to ever make fun of feminists, or perhaps of anyone, or that you just didn't get the joke. So now that I've completely ruined that joke for you by dissecting it, let me try to make amends and repair our damaged, gelastic relationship. One of the great things about studying laughter is that the adjectives for it are gelastic from the Greek and risible from the Latin. Those are almost onomatopoetic. They're such funny words. I just love that. Uh, so let me say that we might actually be able to conceive of a set of jokes that everyone would be included in, more or less. At least they wouldn't have any targets, and nobody would have to worry about being offensive by laughing. So let's try this one. What do Alexander the Great and Winnie the Pooh, if you know this one, please answer it correctly. <laughs> this is a very subtle joke. What do Alexander the Great and Winnie the Pooh have in common? Yes, sir. They have the same middle name. Thank you. <laughs> well done. I'll pay you later. I've heard people say they both have the as a middle name. At which point you're like, because the fun, for any of you who had fun, is in making the what? And then you make the jump, and all of a sudden you're in paradise, gelastically speaking. So that's a pretty innocent joke with uh, no real target. Um, but I think it can have some ethical import in welcoming or excluding people based on their knowledge. So uh, I had this joke up, just, it didn't really fit in the presentation, but I just love it so that I just, everybody get to enjoy that. I haven't actually died to sin, but I did feel kind of faint once. Okay. So now here I think this is not a targeted or cruel joke, but it's definitely an inside joke. So here's John of the Cross, struggling with writer's block before fitting on his now famous Dark Knight of the Soul. Okay. <laughs> and now I, the, I'm having a little problem getting the YouTube and all working, but some of you may know this and may want to sing along with me, but I think this is one of the great inside jokes of all time. Who knows Tom Lehrer's Vatican Rag? Yeah? Can we do a verse? First you get down on your knees, fiddle with your rosaries, bow your head with great respect, and genuflect, genuflect, genuflect. <laughs> okay, that was really rousing. Um, now, actually, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I'm here all week. Um, so I think this is a, a brilliant little piece, and you can find Lara perform, perform it on YouTube. Now, I always actually had just heard it as a lovely little kind of, you know, inside, if you know the Vatican stuff, this is kind of cute. But it turns out that as he introduces it, this actually is a bit targeted. Uh, when he did this, new liturgical music was just starting to come out. And they'll know we are Christ and uh, guitar masses and so on. And he was among those who thought that uh, current hymnody did not live up to the standards of good old Wesleyan hymnody, apparently. So this was kind of an attempt to make fun of that. Anyway, good stuff, I think. Um, so that community relationship is important, I think, when attempts at intimacy fail. So I told a joke, you didn't think it's funny. After that, I really couldn't argue that that feminist joke had an awful lot of value. I hadn't really passed on any information that was useful. I hadn't shared a thing of beauty. Now, from Cohen's perspective, perhaps, the failure of the joke does give us something worthwhile, namely the knowledge that I and you have rather different perspectives. And perhaps we're committed to distinctly and crucially different ways of being human. So laughter, as I've tried to argue, affirms and promotes either a bond or a breach between laugher and target and between laughter and audience. And here's where part of laughter's ambiguity comes in. Laughter, that is, can be spoken of as either affiliative or derisive. Affiliative laughter includes what we often call laughing with. It emphasizes commonality, identifies with its object, invites into friendship, takes a stance of solidarity, empathy, affection. Derisive or distancing laughter refers to the experience of laughing at. It emphasizes difference, dismisses its object, excludes from friendship, and takes a stance of antipathy and condescension. 
Affiliative laughter may have an object, a target, but the laugher jokes about the target in an attitude of affection rather than discounting the target with true derision. Affiliative laughter, that is, emphasizes similarity rather than difference. As a feminist telling the feminist joke, I can be laughing in solidarity with other feminists as we acknowledge that we do sometimes get too serious in our virtuous work for justice. Jerome A. Miller helpfully characterizes such discourse not as ridicule, but as teasing, that is, language that attempts to locate these vulnerabilities precisely in order to celebrate them, not in order to laugh at them. On the other hand, I caution my male friends, even the feminists, not to tell that joke because they may look derisive even if they're not. Now, some derision is pretty clearly derision all the time, and much of it aims to enforce the will of the powerful. Psalm 2 is pretty clear. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord has them in derision. So is Psalm 37. The Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that their day is coming. This may be a disconcerting image of derision, but it is pretty unambiguous. Other examples exploit laughter's ambiguity quite fully. In my very favorite story from the Talmud, a number of rabbis were discussing a point of scripture, and Rabbi Eliezer alone disagreed with the majority. The Talmud tells us, Rabbi Eliezer brought forward every imaginable argument, but they did not accept them. So he said to them, if the religious law, the halakha, agrees with me, let this tree prove it. And the tree moved, some say 100 cubits, others 400 cubits. Does anybody know Noah, the Bill Cosme bit? Yeah. What's a cubit? Um, anyway, through sophisticated arithmetic, I actually can translate that that's about 200 to 800 feet. Pretty impressive tree movement. Still the sages replied, no proof can be brought from a tree. Then Rabbi Eliezer called on a stream of water to support him. And indeed, the stream flowed backward. The sages held to their view. No proof can be brought from a stream of water. This goes on till finally Rabbi Eliezer calls out, if the halakha agrees with me, let it be proved from heaven. At that moment, a voice from heaven spoke, asking, why do you dispute from Ra with Rabbi Eliezer, seeing that in all matters the halakha agrees with him? But the sages objected saying that Torah was given at Sinai and voices from heaven have nothing to add. Sometime later, Rabbi Natan met Elijah and asked him, what did the Holy One, blessed be he, do on that day? And Elijah said, he laughed and said, my children have overruled me, my children have overruled me. Now I got to read this aloud so you got to hear my God, who's this kind of exasperated but loving parent deity, at least that's what I was trying to do. But others disagree with this. Ted Cohen, in fact, is one of them who wrote me back that I totally misunderstand this Talmudic passage and instead says that God's laugh laughter is quite mocking, uh, making fun of his children for trying to reject him when in fact they can. But Rabbi Eric Soroka is with me and agrees that this laughter of a parentally amused God is quite a salutary spiritual image. Let me make two quick notes here. First, the fact that laughter is so relational that it requires the parties involved to share knowledge explains why it's so culturally specific. I got lost on the way here yesterday and got directions from a perfectly nice Catholic man who, on hearing that I taught religion, shared a couple nice anti-Muslim jokes with me. I'm sure that I got lost just so I can enlighten him, and his view is totally different today. Um, I did notice I was, well, we actually won't go into that. We're, we're running behind, and there's so many great things to talk about. Uh, but anyway, second, some have found laughter uh, universally welcome because it can attack pretensions. Some jokes mock the human propensity to spiritual folly. So, for instance, Tabitha was late for a meeting, and as she was going around circling and circling, looking for a parking space, she finally said, Lord, please give me a parking space. If you give me a parking space, I'll go to church every Sunday. I'll give up having that third beer when I go out. I will be so good. And immediately a parking space opened in front of her, at which point Tabitha said, oh, never mind, God, I found one. What's important for our interests here in spirituality and mystery is that the joke doesn't just make fun of Tabitha, it also points the way to a transcendent perspective, the real world operating outside the limit of her sight. Laughter can break through constrained vision to enable true vision. It belongs to the saintly levity that has freed itself from excessive attachment to the world. We hear this laughter in the stories of the ancient and honorable company of those known as fools for Christ, 
In the famous story of St. Lawrence, who being martyred over a gridiron, on a gridiron, said to his, uh, his torturers, this side is cooked, you may turn me over. And in a legend told about the blessed Sabina, a legendary martyr of the second century, who, when asked by the temple warden at Smyrna and his guards why she was laughing, replied, it pleases God. For we are Christians, and they who are in Christ with a firm and constant faith will laugh with everlasting laughter. Laughter doesn't have to extend to martyrdom, though I find it quite interesting that it does. It can work its cathartic salvation in more quotidian circumstances as well. This deeply human laughter is what G.K. Chesterton's protagonist, Gabriel Syme, experiences in The Man Who Was Thursday. When Gabriel finds out that the enemy who has been pursuing him is in fact not an enemy, but an ally, when he finds out in short that he has been wrong, Chesterton gives us this passage. He knew simultaneously that he was a fool and a free man. For with any recovery from morbidity, there must go a certain healthy humiliation. There comes a certain point in such conditions when only three things are possible. First, a perpetuation of satanic pride. Secondly, tears. And third, laughter. Syme's egotism held hard to the first course for a few seconds and then suddenly adopted the third. This spiritual, spiritually salutary laughter affirms the limits of human perception as well as the truth of something greater. Now, I don't want to give the impression that laughter is always so spiritually salutary. I love Nietzsche on laughter, but for him, laughter's purpose is not to fight untruth per se, but to vanquish the spirit of gravity, a spirit which seems to include the noble seriousness needful when we engage questions of human suffering or take up the work of justice. But laughter, unfortunately, can attack truth as easily as illusion, make friends with the devil perhaps more easily than it can with, than with God. I've always thought any discussion of laughter needs to be applicable to the question of how to deal with ist jokes, sexist, racist, ageist, and I think Ted Cohen has a wise approach. More than once, he writes, someone has demanded of me that I explain exactly why anti-Semitic jokes are not funny. I've come to realize that if there is a problem with such jokes, the problem is compounded exactly by the fact that they are funny. Face that fact, and then let us talk about it. Wish that there were no mean jokes. Try remaking the world so that no such jokes will have a place, will not arise. But do not deny that they are funny. That denial is a pretense and will help nothing. And it is at least possible sometimes that the jokes themselves do help something. Perhaps they help us to bear affronts like crude racism and stubborn prejudice by letting us laugh while we take a breather. Now, as promised, I've subjected you to a speech arguing that laughter is ambiguous, ethical, and relational, and thus suited to mystery and live spirituality. So I'd like to look in particular at two questions that I think we'd all agree are among the central Christian mysteries and see how laughter might approach them in a salutary way, as I've argued it can. Now, I'm realizing I don't know when we started, darling. When do, when do we need to wrap up? Yeah? OK. Because we stay here till? OK. <laughs> you get much more. OK, so first, Christology, in particular the mystery of the divinity and humanity of Christ. Um, OK, well, I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. But first, I'm going to answer a different question, one that maybe you wondered about and will be happy to finally have answered, the question of what Jesus looked like. <laughs> he was a man in stature middling tall and comely, having a reverend countenance, which those who look upon may love and fear, having hue, hair of the hue of an unripe hazelnut, and smooth almost down to his ears, but from the ears and curling locks, somewhat darker and more shining, flowing over his shoulders, having a parting at the middle of the head according to the fashion of the Nazarenes, a brow smooth and very calm, and with a face without wrinkle or any blemish, which a moderate red color makes beautiful, with a nose and mouth no fault at all can be found, having a full beard of the color of his hair, not long but a little forked at the chin, having an expression simple and mature, the eyes gray, flashing, and clear. The description comes from a text that exists in several forms, some of which carry an introduction that ascribe the letter to a Roman soldier named Lentulus. Lentulus is said to have lived in Judea during the time of Tiberius Caesar and to have been so impressed by what he saw of Jesus' preaching and healing that he wrote that description of him to the Roman Senate. 
Now, curiously, while this apocryphal epistle, now known as the Letter of Lentulus, hasn't settled the question of Jesus' looks, some of us still think maybe he had brown eyes, I don't know, it did found a venerable tradition about his laughter. For this passage goes on to describe Jesus as, in rebuke, terrible, an admonition, kind and lovable, cheerful, yet keeping gravity. Sometimes he has wept, but never laughed. This very passage, some say, was the source for John Chrysostom, who became, in turn, the main source in the later church for the argument that Jesus never laughed. Largely thanks to Chrysostom, the question of Jesus' laughter has remained alive in the church, engaging the interest of thinkers from Basil and Augustine to Erasmus, and perhaps most famously in recent years, a Spanish monk by the name of Jorge, the devilish antagonist of Umberto Eco's famous and very hard novel, The Name of the Rose. This long conversation on the topic of Jesus' laughter is possible because the canon of scripture is silent on the issue. Chrysostom is right that the scriptures that were ultimately accepted into the Christian Bible, at least, say that Jesus wept, but say nothing about whether or not he laughed. Especially in cases of scriptural silence, our understandings of Jesus are guided by the values we already hold. The question about Jesus' laughter, then, isn't a question of history or biblical exegesis, but a question about our image of who Jesus was, about who we believe the Christ to be. What we see in Jesus is what we value in humanity, what we reverence in divinity. So it is, I'd suggest, with Chrysostom. Underlying this view of laughter is an assumption held by ancient monastics, and also by many others, that if we're truly aware of the suffering and sinfulness of life, as Jesus surely was, then our lives will not include laughter. When I think about laughter, I usually start with the conviction that took Christians quite some time, to be honest, to figure out that Jesus was fully human. Laughter has been defined as the province of humans, at least since Aristotle, and so it has been argued by some, fewer to be sure than the followers of Lentulus and Chrysostom, that to be fully human, Jesus simply had to laugh. As Athanasius argued, it was appropriate for the Lord, when he was clothed in human flesh, to put it on in its totality, together with all the passions proper to it, so that just as we say the body was properly his, so also the passions of the body might be said to belong to him, even though they did not touch him in his deity. Or, as Walter Principe has it, Christ had to assume every part of human nature to save it. In other words, Jesus was human, humans laughed, therefore Jesus laughed. Except that, obviously, we remember that Jesus wasn't like other humans in all things, not sin, so we need to add the premise that it's good for humans to laugh, that a full human life lived in communion with God, the abundant life that Jesus lived and taught, includes laughter. This is, I think, why Chrysostom argued so much against it, because he denounced laughter as indecorous and even dangerously habit-forming in a world that demands the exercise of reason and devotion. On this reading, to say that Jesus was human is one thing. To say that Jesus laughed suggests that he was not in control of his humanity. In cultures that place a great value on the disciplining of the passions, including the monastic culture responsible for many of the Christian condemnations of laughter, Jesus' laughter would signify not that he was fully human, but that his realization of humanity was immature, incomplete. At the same time, the scriptures testify that Jesus ate and drank, helped people celebrate, welcomed children, had dear friends, put up with exasperating apostles, and did other things frequently associated with laughter. And as I mentioned, apoc apocryphal gospels like the infancy gospel of Thomas and some Gnostic texts testify to the fact that Jesus' relatively early followers told stories of his laughter. Remembering that laughter is culturally shaped, and that those arguing against Jesus' laughter tend to be strongly influenced by monastic codes, maybe those of us not governed by monastic anti-gelastics can reimagine Jesus as laughing. A spirituality built on such a perspective, it seems to me, affirms the goodness of humanity and laughter as an aspect of that humanity. It also invites us to make our laughter, like all in which people imitate Jesus, holy. Aristotle taught that utrapalia, the virtue of turning well or appropriate humor, was, like all virtues, something we could train within ourselves. 
I think Christian spirituality can aspire to laugh like Jesus. All right, so we'll have... Now this one's just kind of cute. There aren't a lot of good cartoons about Jesus that I'm willing to show. <laughs> Everybody gets the reference? <laughs> no, the hand, the side was not enough. We need a piggyback ride. I think it's kind of good. Um, oops. Now, it should be really funny to think I've dispensed with the mystery of Christology in a few minutes, so while we're on a roll, let's take care of the Odyssey, shall we? <laughs> Last week, God and Jesus were in the main lobby, rolling on the carpet, laughing about hell. <laughs> Who could have known they'd take that seriously, God said. They've been worrying about that for 2,000 years. He snorted and fell into convulsions of laughter. And, and, Jesus said, wiping tears from his shining eyes, and we were only kidding. God, they must think we're mean. And they walked off, slapping their foreheads and kneecaps, and Jesus' hat, which is leather, by the way, fell off. <laughs> this report is from Stephen Bartholomew's Heaven, a short story set in paradise, a paradise that resembles, as the narrator tells us, a very large day's inn. Bartholomew's image, two of the three persons of the Trinity lost in laughter at those foolish mortal scary stories, is a fine one for depicting the comic side of the usually solemn subject of theodicy, the problem of evil in light of the goodness and power of God. It's comic because, first of all, there's a happy ending. No one, as it turns out, has ever had to worry about how. Suffering is limited to a lifetime and ended by death. In this sense, Bartholomew's vision fits into a long line of theodicies that trace the problem of evil to the limits of human sight. For surely eye has not seen and ear has not heard. So the humans who serve as the butt of God and Jesus' laughter may be deceived in their understanding of evil and the divine and laughable as a result. To think of God as powerless or uncaring or, to borrow from Bartholomew, mean, it's just to reveal what fools we mortals are. And so we can laugh in affiliation with our own limited but loved selves. All their theologizing, and there they are, those mortals, like Gabriel Syme, wrong. Isn't that funny? But when you think about it, those mortals aren't just perpetuating hoaxes on themselves. God and Jesus were just kidding. Or, as we might put it more explicitly, telling a rather complicated joke and not bothering to explain or maybe even get to the punchline. And it's hard not to see their laughter in the lobby as derisive, laughter at humans more than laughter with them. Laughter, then, can do more than merely acknowledge humans' inability to understand suffering. Bartholomew's portrayal also seems to question the divine, perhaps for failing to make the real story clear, perhaps for faults that are less subtle and more nefarious. Now, I don't think Bartholomew is trying to propound a religious vision here. He's writing a secular story. But many within the Christian tradition have used laughter in similar ways, to engage the question of human suffering, both by pointing out humanity's limitations and by challenging God. Because laughter is ambiguous, grounded in ethical standards and relational, it can express and respond to the reality of suffering. As a result, it offers the religious imagination a vocabulary in which to grapple with the problem of theodicy, a problem philosophy has been notoriously unable to resolve. If we don't try to force laughter to answer philosophical problems, I think we can find that it has something, well, okay, a few things, to offer in engaging the question of theodicy. First, it breaks the idols we might set up as gods, distorted images of divinity, we don't have time to look at many pastors of Mark Twain's here, but he's absolutely brilliant on this. Second, hmm. laughter isn't just derisive, and it is always ambiguous and liable to slide from one meaning to another. So laughter gives spirituality a way to say what most theodicy comes down to in the end, but which systematic theology, which is more admirably bound to the rules of logic, cannot so easily say that God is responsible for human suffering, and that God is not responsible for human suffering. Laughter can mock and forgive in the same ambivalent breath. As W.H. Auden has it, 
We laugh because we simultaneously protest and accept. We might find some guidance towards this in Paul Ricoeur's The Symbolism of Evil, which argues that mythic stories can present in narrative form truths that would be unacceptable, even logically incoherent, if expressed in systematic form. I think laughter accomplishes the same challenge to linear reason that narrative does. So God can laugh and still be loving. God can be laughed at and still be loved. There are a number of images of this that people have worked on. Some of them, I think, are rather generous towards God and just try to bring out an image of God as somewhat more human. So maybe God can even be lonely. And then some, you may know this one if you're an onion reader. Look at God's mercurial actions. It's really not God's fault at all. But just a, and I, I kind of love, don't you love J. Henry Jurgens or Jurgens? Isn't that exactly what he would look like? The Yale psychologist and divinity professor. It's really just, just kind of too good. Um, so God's just manic depressive. It's not really his fault. But sometimes God is a little bit more responsible. <laughs> and I know at least the people in uh, the theology department are heading from here to a meeting. So here's really the ultimate theodicy. Fourth. Laughter is appropriate for dealing with theodicy because it points away from heaven and toward earth. Laughter in theodicy, after all, is upholding ethical standards, calling God to account for earthly evil. At the same time, the one who judges God by laughing is called to these same ethical standards and so is called to relieve earthly evil. If God tolerates human suffering, we laugh at God, but then we must also strive to be better than God. Finally, Anne Sexton may be right when she insists that God is not mocked except by believers. Laughter, instead of dismissing God, can participate in a complex relationship with the divine. I'll stick with you, but I'm going to tease you. We might ponder in this regard Job's final speech to God, in which he's generally believed to say he repents in dust and ashes, presumably for questioning God's justice. God immediately restores him and deliciously sends his misguided friends to ask for Job's prayers. But apparently, most of our translations are rather inaccurate there, and I've read several sources and talked to several Hebrew scholars, and there may be some here. And the Hebrew apparently really is much more ambiguous and suggests that maybe Job says he repents of dust and ashes, that is, repents of repentance, a statement that could well be heard as rather sarcastic. Is this edgy defiance, perhaps, something on the edge of laughter? If it is, it still continues Job's relationship with God. Laughter at God, or images of God's laughter at mortals, can accomplish in gesture what can't be accomplished by reason. When there is no clear way to think, there is still something to do, this active relational event of laughter. If nothing else, perhaps we can apply Cohen's advice and allow ourselves the occasional non-theologically correct breather. There's just something satisfying in Woody Allen's line, not only is there no God, but just try getting a plumber on weekends. All right, so I'm going to jump to the end and not talk about science and uh, interfaith relationship, but invite you, if you want to hear more, we can talk about that. Um, Basically, I, I hope that uh, even in cutting a couple of pages, I've done as I promised and given you a sense of laughter's ambiguity, ethical nature, importance in relationship, and ability to engage, though not resolve, the mysteries of Christianity and day-to-day -day realities of Christian spirituality. In the end, I'd like to close by quoting Chesterton yet again. Life is serious all the time, but living cannot be. You may have all the solemnity you wish in your neckties, but in anything important, such as sex, death, and religion, you must have mirth or you will have madness. Thank you for your mirth and your seriousness. Mm -hmm.